Welcome to Horror Makes Us Happy, the podcast where we ask the question, what is it about horror that makes us happy? Your hosts are Steve Becker and myself, Chris Whitman. And you can find out more about us at our website, horrormakesushappy.com. Before we get started, this is the trigger warning. This is a horror podcast. We're going to be talking about horror culture and horror things. So it could involve sensitive subjects such as child abuse, murder, rape. There will be bad language and we will be talking about dark things. So with that out of the way... Before we get into our guest today, Steve, do we have uh, what, kind, what kind of things do we have coming down the pike? Oh, let's see. Well, uh, after StokaCon and Days of the Dead, we've got, like, last count, we now have eight or nine authors on the calendar, a director and an actor. Uh, so a lot of stuff uh, that I'm not going to go out and list everything individually. There is a um, lot. Thank yes. you for going to StokaCon, by the way. And yes. fuck you for going to StokaCon, but that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> For self-promotion stuff, uh, Chris's webcomic is at pieces-compendium.com or what was the other one? Piecesofflesh.com? Yes. And for my book, uh, Guide to the Recovery Toolbox, I've created a promotional code that you can get the electronic version for 99 cents at smashwords.com. And the promotional code is LE69E, and that is good for 90 days. Yes, nice. Uh, What else? What else? What else? I think that's it for now. Yeah, stuff, things, yeah. lots of guests coming up. We got our own projects. You can check them out. There are links on the website. Yes. But for today's episode, we have with us author and novelist of nonfiction and Halloween expert. All kinds of, uh, yes, a, a, a nonfiction and Halloween expert, six time Bram Stoker Award winner, and novelist of over 100 short stories, eight novels and novellas, and seven nonfiction books, particularly on the history of Halloween. Lisa Morton. Hello. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. And I'm going to apologize to everyone listening in advance for my horrible voice because I have contracted mm. a minor cold. So just pretend it sounds like, you know, Tallulah Bankhead or something hot. <laughs> <laughs> that works. That works. Yeah. Sorry, uh, you're not but- feeling well, but uh, that, that does kind of, you know, lend to the theme of the show. It makes it spookier with the gravelly voice. <laughs> there we go. Maybe I should keep it. I say keep it. But then you wouldn't feel well, so don't keep it. Ah, damn. Right. There's always that part. Keep, yeah. keep, keep the right. voice, not the illness. Mm. Before we get into the meat of the interview, do you want to let us know what you're currently working on? Uh, I just finished earlier this year my first coffee table art book, which I am really thrilled about. It was mm. really fun to do. It is coming out October 1st, and it is called The Art of the Zombie Movie. Mm. After that, in December, I will have a novella coming out from Cemetery Dance that was co-written with John Palisano, and it is called Placerita. Placerita. Interesting. Yeah, something with zombies just recently in our last interview with Tim Wagoner came up, which I I found interesting, which was uh, he commented on how classic zombies are. they, They hadn't even really evolved to the we will eat your brains, we will eat your flesh yet. It was just reanimated human beings and that that was spooky enough and steve and i were discussing it in the break just now just like how it's it's interesting how it did start with the uh the people that were given a poison in haiti that would cause them to appear to be dead and then they would reanimate so we went from that to quote unquote voodoo zombies which are just reanimated dead people and then that evolved into the the cannibalistic angle of it it's just yeah you know, interesting little uh zombie Evolution. tidbit there History. Definitely, yeah. There's like pre-1968 and post-1968 in the history of zombies. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't know how much we talked offline about the theme of the interview, but basically we have like four sections. We talk about your childhood, your teenage years, and then your adulthood. And then the fourth section, we kind of do a wrap up where we talk about whatever topics may have come up in the earlier three sections. Uh, But that said, it's not meant to be a therapy session. So if there's anything you don't want to answer, just say pass and we'll move on. But starting with childhood, what are your summer early, some of your earliest memories about scary things? I grew up here in uh, L.A. I'm an L.A. born and raised native and um, uh, kind of during a a time that was a golden age for horror and for Halloween both. um, I grew up on a steady diet of the Universal Monster movies because they were running nonstop in their syndicated package when I was a kid. And I don't remember this, but my parents used to tell me that at the age of three, I was seriously traumatized by Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but which I recently watched again and, you know, found completely delightful and have no idea what I reacted to in that. But um, 
I loved monster movies, and I, I think I kind of I often identified with the monsters because I was a sort of weird kid who was kind of the outsider, and you know, and seeing a Frankenstein's monster or the Wolfman or something as a perpetual outsider was something I really identified with. You were not the first person we've spoken to that has said that. I'm <laughs> sure. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, anything else to jump out to you other than the Universals? One memory I have. Um, from I think I was about six was since we were in LA we were going to Disneyland a lot my parents loved it and um, I remember being about six and my dad taking me into the long gone 20,000 leagues under the sea exhibit and there was one part where you went past this porthole and I was so small I couldn't see what was outside the porthole and and he lifted me up with sort of a gleeful look on his face because he knew what I didn't which was that the giant squid was lurking outside that porthole. And um, that's something that gave me a really delicious fright. Um, I was both terrified and absolutely couldn't take my eyes off of it. Nice. Interesting that you used the word delicious at six. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was really fun. I mean, it was scary, but it was also fun. I think, you know, even at six, you know that this is not completely real and you're safe and your dad's holding you and, you know. I was just going to say the, the grin on your dad's face may have, might have helped too. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, a number of our guests have reported sort of a dividing line where prior to this, they were afraid of it uh, of horror, And then after the dividing line, they were now uh, enjoying it. Was there some sort of a dividing line for you or were you always uh, enjoying it? I mean, other than the Abbott Costello one that you mentioned. Um, I think I always enjoyed it. There was a very specific dividing line for me at the point when I realized this is actually what I want to do for a living. Um, And that was when I was 15 and saw The Exorcist. We'll come to that here when we get to the teenage section, but I'll make a note of that. Uh, In childhood, you mentioned participating in Halloween. Did you have a favorite costume? I did. Um, Halloween was kind of a big deal in our household. No surprise, considering what I've gone on to write. Um, And my dad was this crazy hunter. I mean, really obsessed with it. And we always had weird stuff around the house like deer hides. And um, Mm. I think when I was in first grade, there was a sitcom on the air at that time that was called it's about time which was about these astronauts who are stuck back in caveman days and i okay. i wanted to be kind of see where this might be yeah going. as a result of that i wanted to be a cave woman so my mom and dad actually made me like a really insanely authentic cave woman outfit from an actual deer mm-hmm. hide and um mm-hmm. i i remember loving that but being kind of frustrated that i was so so small i couldn't carry a wooden club so I did have to, <laughs> I had to resort to a pretend plastic wooden club, but I, that was probably my favorite outfit. Doing a little uh, Wilma Flintstone impersonation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see, at least, do do you remember having a least favorite costume? Um, hmm, I don't. Um, I never liked the, the box store-bought costumes because I always, I was obsessed with like authenticity, even at a really young age. So I didn't care for those. And I think I may have gotten stuck with one, one year or something. Hmm. A little bit too plain and generic. Yeah. 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 Was it the process of dressing up or putting on makeup that you enjoyed or the, what's the word I'm looking for? The transformation into another character, maybe. Right. Yeah. It, it was the, I call it the empowerment because um, trick or treat was very different back then from what it is for kids nowadays. And I actually feel kind of sorry for kids in that their parents now go with them. Yeah. You know, when I was a kid, you were on your own. You were dressed up as a character you liked. You were out on this sort of magical night and you were, were being rewarded mm. for all of this with candy. I, it was just like the most perfect night of the year. Yeah. Yeah. Tim brought the, something similar up too. And yeah, you're right. You know, when, when it gets down to it, it's, it's so different nowadays because back then it was, um, it was an adventure. You know, you, you had the risk and the reward, the risk of going up to some random person's house. And it was a little scary. The theme of the night was overall scary, but you did it. You went out and you faced that, uh, that challenge and, and you got, yeah, exactly right. Yeah. (laughs) Hmm. Did you have anybody in your family who were fans of horror? Um, I was an only child and both of both 
both of my parents liked it. My um, my mom and I would often stay up late watching horror movies. My dad and I would actually make Aurora Monster kits together. Um, and they both kind of enjoyed it. Um, maybe not to the extent that I obviously ended up, but. Okay. Well, I mean, having uh, any positive influence is helpful. Let's see. Did you have any recurring dreams or scary dreams when you were a kid? Um, not as a kid. Later on, I had for a number of years, I had a very strange recurring nightmare about choking. And I, I don't know truthfully if that was a physical thing that was happening and translating into a nightmare or what. But um, thankfully, I haven't had that dream for a long time. Mm. Mm-hmm. Oh, excuse me. All of a sudden, I can't stop yawning. Oh, excuse me. Um, let's see. Did you have anything in real life terrify you as a child? Um, I don't know that I would say terrify in terms of real life. It was kind of, it, it was a weird childhood, truthfully. Um, because of my dad's obsession with hunting, I would periodically get pulled out of school, which I loved. I loved school. Um, and dragged off to like freaking Idaho or something. And my mom and I would be stuck <laughs> in the freezing cold camper for like a week while dad was out trying to kill a deer. And, um, you know, and then I would, he would come back to the camp a few days later and he'd have this dead deer and I would like help him carve these things up and, um, or do the same thing with fish. And it was really, it was odd. I'm sure. I mean, I don't know if, any other kids in Southern California who were likely to have grown up with that? Uh, you might be surprised. Uh, I mean, I lived in Chicago and my next door neighbors were um, Puerto Rican and the, my grandmother used to, she didn't drive. So she would have to get up early in the morning to take the buses to work and, and home. And so she would leave me with the next door neighbors and the grandparents didn't speak any English whatsoever. Uh, but like two, three blocks away in the city, there was a carniceria where they would have live animals. I remember particularly rabbits and chickens. Um, and I don't think they had geese, but it wouldn't surprise me, but you, you would go in there and she'd point to the one that she would want and she would, they would take it out back and kill it and feather it for you. And then she'd bring it home and she'd be gutting the thing on the table in front of me while I'm doing my homework. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. So I know there's a large Hispanic community in in uh, California, so it wouldn't surprise me even in LA if there was stuff like that. Yeah. Um, let's see. It was flipping that question around. Was there ever a time in your childhood when you were feeling completely calm or safe or at bliss? Yeah, actually, most of the time it was a. Um, I'm sure people tend to think of horror writers as having had like traumatic childhoods or abusive or something. It was actually pretty great. Um, Mm. The only part of it that was weird was, and I I hate saying this because it's going to sound like really awful bragging, (laughs) but I used to do (laughs) insanely well on IQ test. I I just had this, this Mm. gift for nailing these stupid IQ tests and they would periodically pull me out and take me to weird places like a janitor's closet or something and give me more tests. And they were always trying to tell my parents, oh, she shouldn't be in this school. She needs to be in a special school. And um, I never wanted to go to a special school. I liked my little suburban um, public schools. And I really liked the teachers and I had my friends and everything. And um, we did move a lot as a kid because my dad his way of making a living was he was an engineer who did worked on like a consulting basis. So we were always moving Mm -hmm. around. We were never in the same house for more than a couple of years. And that was a little weird, but um, other than that, it was, it was a pretty nice, calm childhood. Um, And I was a huge reader from a very young age. And so obviously grew up with books and. Okay. Going back to the um, Universal Monsters, were there particular monsters that you enjoyed, or I kind of loved them all, but um, I I may have a special fondness, I think, for the creature from the Black Lagoon, just because I loved the design of that monster. That is one that I have not seen myself. I keep needing to go back and look at that. Uh, Let's see. Well, moving into some of the teen stuff, uh, you mentioned The Exorcist. What else jumps out to you as being impactful in your teen years? 
my teen years were very different from my earlier childhood. My parents actually got divorced when I was about 14, and um, I moved in with my mom. And um, we, her mother, um, or actually her grandmother, who had raised her because she was orphaned at a very young age, ended up with a series of strokes and dementia and moved in with us. So from about the time that I was 15 or so onward, I became her caregiver. My mom was working, and when I wasn't at school, I would be home um, taking care of my great-grandmother. And so, um, again, it was a it was a very kind of strange, definitely not the breakfast club for my teen years, you know. Um, mm. I became a little bit isolated, I think, as a result of that, and um, because I wasn't able to go out and do a lot of the things that other high school kids were doing at the time. Right. Can relate, not necessarily for being a caregiver, but uh, also was kind of isolated in my high school years as well. How about media in terms of either books or movies or stories? Yeah, I did discover a lot of my favorite authors in that time. Um, I mean, The Exorcist was a movie. My mother took me to see it, and um, it literally changed my life because before I saw that movie, I, I thought I was going to go into the sciences of all things. And after that, I knew I wanted to do that. I wanted to have that kind of impact on people. Because what that movie did to an audience in like 1974 was insane. Mm. And I just was really drawn to the idea of being able to do that. And my school counselors were horrified when I came back and said, no, 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 I want to be a screenwriter now. No, you can't do that. I mean, they would literally try to talk me out of it. <laughs> yeah, that was interesting. <laughs> and uh, I was having none of it and ended up going to college and majoring in film. And um, But anyways, before that... I discovered a lot of my favorite authors like um, Ray Bradbury and and Theodore Sturgeon and H.P. Lovecraft. And um, I was a super gigantic reader, I think, during my teens and just gobbled stuff up like crazy. What was the one that you mentioned between Bradbury and Lovecraft? Uh, Theodore Sturgeon. He was stuff, he, he was a science fiction writer who um, was kind of a, this the same period as Bradbury and... Um, a l little bit before like Harlan Ellison and Philip K. Dick, but his stuff is very humanistic, um, not so much hard science, but much more um, where people are going to go in the future and and things like that. And he also kind of segued a few times into horror, and um, I just really, really loved the sort of human element of his work. Hmm. Exploring the relationships? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Going back to The Exorcist for a moment, you mentioned specifically the job of screenwriter. How did you land on that, considering, you know, when you talk about movies, there's so many different, uh, you know, roles in movie making. How did you land on screenwriter? Well, I actually was kind of aiming for screenwriter slash director. Um, but as I got more into things. I realized that directing may, maybe was not really what I wanted to do so much as just be a screenwriter. And I um, actually did end up working as a screenwriter for a while in the late 80s, early 90s. And it wasn't until I had a very minor amount of success at it that I realized that also was not for me. And uh, <laughs> at that point is when I made the move into fiction. Okay. Yeah, I saw you had a little uh, work in that. Going back to the other stuff than Ray Bradbury and Lovecraft, um, any particular works stand out? Any particular topics? Um, certainly with Bradbury, Something Wicked This Way Comes was an mm -hmm. incredible book. Um, with Lovecraft, it's, I, it all kind of runs together in my head, just the massive amount of short fiction he did, and I, I read all of it at some point or other. Um, and there was one book that really made me decide I wanted to write fiction, and that was a book by a uh, an L.A.-based author named Dennis Etchison. The book was called The Dark Country, and it was a collection of stories that came out in about 81, I think, and um, it just blew me away, and I, I was so lucky to be able to um, become a good friend of Dennis's, and um, he remains my favorite writer, actually. What did you like about The Dark Country? 
for one thing, it was all set in L.A. Um, or in uh, areas that I knew that were kind of near L.A., like um, Ensenada, just south of the um, U.S.-Mexico border. And um, I thought it was incredible that I had never read horror set in my hometown. That was amazing right off the bat. But also the way he kind of dissected society was incredible. A lot of his work is about this sort of tension in between classes and um, it was the kind of thing that I realized when I read it that I think I would actually love to write stuff like this. So it was very influential on me. Okay. Hmm. Uh, Halloween as a teen? Um, yeah, it was, uh, you know, you go through that uncomfortable period as a, as a teen where you're like, I don't know, should I still trick or treat or what? What's now? You know, what's next? Um, and for a long time, it, it was not a huge holiday to me. Um, I didn't, I was never like the type to go to a lot of parties and so forth. Big surprise. And um, I think it, it ended up um, with me being more interested in the history of the holiday as time wore on. I started working at a uh, used bookstore and we would get these amazing, interesting little like pamphlets through. They did um, dozens and dozens of pamphlets about Halloween history and parties from the 1920s to the 30s. And these things would show up, and they were so interesting that I just started taking a, an interest in the history of the holiday. Uh -huh. um, curious, when you say pamphlets, for whom, written by whom? They're actually like little, they're little party guides, and they usually run anywhere from like 60 to 100 pages. Um, they may have a few very simple graphics in them. And they normally consist of a section on um, uh, how to design your party, how to create your invitations. They might include recipes, um, games you can play at the party, costumes you can make. Um, and they would often have like a little tiny bit of history about Halloween in them and uh, even songs you could sing at the party. And um, I just I was so charmed by these that I started collecting them. And uh, thank goodness I did. Now they're very hard to get and many of them are insanely expensive. Mm. Yeah, now that you described them a little bit better, I think I know what you're talking about because it reminds me of some very old um, like Boy Scout kind of material that I had found my, I think it might've been my father's or maybe older than that. But like you say, it was, it's very interesting. Like it was instru like instructions on how to hold a party. Yeah. Yeah. I'm <laughs> like sure that they are very similar. <laughs> well, in the Boy Scouts, case it wasn't just in terms of like halloween parties but like how to hold an event basically um okay so no favorite costume or least favorite costume for halloween and teens um you mentioned having a dream where you were choking was that teenage years or adult years that was like early 20s late teens through early 20s and it kind of vanished by the time i hit my late 20s and um I had it, like I said, for many years off and on, and I, I still to this day do not know what occasioned that. The first thing that comes to mind, I mean, I know we haven't talked about much else yet, uh, so maybe there are other connections, but like the first thing that I thought of is, you know, a lot of people who have to do to become caregivers for family members, particularly as children, do feel often stifled that you know it's it's not necessarily a pleasant thing to say but you know it's not always an option that uh is given to everybody right and so i wonder if there was maybe some emotional connection there uh you did mention feeling a bit isolated in terms of your social circle so maybe there's a connection there but like i say that we just barely started talking, so there might be other better connections than that. I, I think there could certainly be something to that. It, it also, a few times I wondered if it might have had to do with the fact that this was the time of my life when I was trying to define myself as a writer. And trying mm -hmm. to get the ideas out was, you know, this maybe my subconscious ah. was turning that into choking on these things. Yeah, not being able to find your words. Yeah, mm-hmm. 
Uh, was there ever a time in real life that terrified something terrified you as a teen? Um, hmm. Not terrified, but I would say that um, dealing with my great grandmother was very difficult because um, I know when people hear dementia, they quite often think it's some mild kind of, oh, I can't remember what I had for lunch. Um, it quite often translates into very aggressive behavior, and she was yes. um, very difficult to take care of to the point where we couldn't keep a hired caregiver. Most of them would walk out after two hours. Um, so, yeah, that was that was very difficult, and it, it, it was, I think, the hardest part for me of that was seeing the effect that had on my mom, who um, would often just spend her days sobbing over this um so yeah and then um it kind of came full circle a few years ago when my mother developed dementia and i became her caregiver mm. so mm -hmm. yeah we um i can't speak to chris but my grandmother fortunately was um she got dementia but she her personality was she was always a very kind person, so we didn't have that <laughs> that that particular subset of problems with that. Mm -hmm. Can relate. It happens in generations like that with uh, dementia and dealing with the elderly. And you're right; there is a little bit of an ironic twist when uh, you, know, you, you see your parents dealing with it, and then you deal with it yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, flipping that question around in your teens, was there a time where you felt completely calm or safe or bliss? I think, as weird as it sounds, that moment when I was in the theater watching The Exorcist and I knew that this was what I had to do with my life was an, it okay. was close to an okay. almost transcendent moment. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Um, based on the isolation, I didn't really ask, but I, I guess I can ask anyway, just for the uh, for the no that it's going to get. Hmm? But um, did you have any friends or other family in your teens that? were also friends of horror or fans of horror. I was actually kind of um, a part of a science fiction group in my teens. Okay. Um, our local university had a science fiction club that I discovered. And even though it was run out of the college and I was still in high school at the time, I became a part of that. So it was almost like horror adjacent. Okay. That's helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Often the, uh, the social, element of it is well not for everybody but it it can play a big role in what brings people to you know the community sometimes mm -hmm. all right so common themes so far um some isolation but also some connection like you say with this sci-fi group and finding a path of what you want to do in life with the exorcist that's a, a good first step uh -huh. and then Moving into adulthood, uh, adulthood. What kind of media would you say had really jumped out to you as impactful in your adult years? I certainly became more interested in horror as a young adult. Um, I had read as one does. a lot more science fiction. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, a couple of movies that were very impactful for me, um, Carpenter's Halloween, um, and uh, certainly Alien. Mm -hmm. um, I think Alien probably had a tremendous impact on those of us who happen to be female. <laughs> One scene um, in particular, yeah. And Halloween as well. Yeah, right. I, but, you know, you're looking at it and you're going, oh, finally, there's a there's a woman who's not, like, tripping over her own feet and um, screaming and so forth. So that was really cool with the, um, Alien, I think. And um, mm -hmm. in the 80s, I wasn't a huge fan of most of the slasher movies. Um, they got kind of derivative for me, but um, I certainly did love a few things like Near Dark and, and then, of course, later on, Silence of the Lambs. Mm. So you were more a fan of cerebral horror, it sounds like, and less yeah, uh, yeah. blood and gore. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'm not familiar with Near Dark. What was that one? This is the one with Bill Paxton, but a bunch of vampires. It it actually is Catherine Bigelow's second feature film as a director. Um, it's a it's a vampire film. It is the first half of it in particular is absolutely just gorgeous as well as being very weird. Mm -hmm. And um, it's vampires traveling the Midwest in, in a Winnebago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have to rewatch that. It's been a while. 
there was uh, one of the female characters in it too was someone who's been in a lot of other movies since. There's a Jeanette Goldstein is in it from Aliens. Hey, yeah, yeah, that was it. And um, uh, oh, the wonderful actress who actually plays this sort of romantic lead, and her name is escaping me at the moment, but she's terrific in the film. Still, always tickles me the whole situation with Jeanette Goldstein, where there's that line in Aliens. Uh, you know, they, they say that somebody was looking for illegal aliens and she signed up and that's, um, isn't that how she got the role for aliens? She, she wasn't aware it was a, an actual alien movie and thought it was something with illegal aliens. <laughs> I hadn't heard that. That's a great story. R- wrong place at the right time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned, uh, near dark, the first half being gorgeous. What was are you just talking about the setting or the writing or what? Uh, the the way it's shot. Um, Catherine Bigelow is an extraordinary filmmaker, I think, and it, it just has this sort of beautiful um, night cinematography and these extraordinary, mm-hmm. um, beautifully composed portraits of people, that kind yeah. of thing. So many people at the time just couldn't get you know night filming right. Everybody did uh, day for night shots, but that is one thing I always noticed about Near Dark too. Which is you know, fittingly enough with the title, the dark. It's just so well Yeah, done. exactly right. Yeah. You also mentioned it being a weird movie. What was weird about it? Um, that it is, um, uh, it takes such a different uh, look at vampires. Um, uh, no one else had done a vampire movie quite like this before, where it sets them very solid, solid, solidly in the middle of like um, the rural Midwest. The young male lead, uh, Adrian Pazdar, his parents, uh, his dad is, is a vet. He grew up on a ranch. He's showing these vampires how to lasso cattle, that kind of thing. <laughs> so was this uh, like a story of them finding other uh, prey other than humans, shall we say? It is. No? Yeah, no, it's actually a love story because the young... The young yeah. cowboy has fallen for the the young the pretty young vampire. Um, ah. in- it's similar to Lost Boys in that regard. Yeah, you have a guy who moves into a new town, uh, has a run in with vampires, meets pretty girl vampire, boy meets girl story. Got it. With a twist. With a twist. Yeah. yeah. And Lance Henriksen. What did you like about Silence of the Lambs? Uh, I had read the book first, and um, I had a few friends who we all just love that book and um one of the things i love about it is what a faithful adaptation it is right down to uh the car that clarice drives the shoes she wears i mean they really just nailed the book and it was so nice to see an adaptation that did not veer wildly away from a really good book and um of course those performances and just how impeccably made that film is and um, one of the one of the weird technical aspects of that film that I loved was the sound mix. Um, I used to like just crank that thing at home and listen to the way the sound was mixed whenever she would go visit Hannibal Lecter in those sort of underground <laughs> cells. It was just full of these weird like background echoes and so forth. Interesting. Uh, so I'm, the vibe I'm getting from that is that your interest was more. Um, as an auteur, shall we say, rather than like the gut uh, connection for, with the horror? Yeah, I'm, I'm a sucker for things that are just really well crafted, I think. Okay. What about Carpenter's Halloween? I went to see that with a couple of friends, probably opening weekend. And um, I, that was a movie that was just such an exercise in suspense. And it was genuinely... I, I think we all came out of that theater on edge, um, and I, it takes a lot to to scare me. So the fact that that movie put me through a ringer was really a testament to just how good it was. And um, another one that did that to me was Dawn of the Dead, which I actually did see on opening night, and I was very young at the time. I was, I think, my second year in college. And one of the teaching assistants said to me, hey, you like horror? Let's go see this movie. And I actually had no idea what it was. I had not seen, for some reason, Night of the Night of the Living Dead at the time. And that thing just absolutely destroyed me for about a week afterwards. Oh, so. I had never seen a film that, that was that, that violent or that gory. But um, I think it was just the sort of oppressive, nonstop 
violence and breakdown of society in that 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 really um, really caught me and it became kind of another one that was very influential on me I um, you know obviously my next book is a book about zombies so um, mm. mm-hmm. there's something there I had never heard of Night of the Living Dead or no had heard of Night of the Living Dead but didn't yeah, see it yeah right? for some reason I had never watched it I mean they were running it to death at that point and I don't know why I had never sat down to watch it Remind me again, was Dawn of the Dead the one in the uh, mall? It is, yeah. yeah. Okay. I can never remember this. Was Dawn of the Dead or Day of the Dead the one where the uh, hands come out of the wall in the beginning in the dream that's, sequence? That's Day of the Dead. That's what I thought. Okay. I don't know that one. <laughs> it's hard to keep them, all, keep them all straight. Dude, there are so many, especially <laughs> now. It's just, it's out of control. Yeah. <laughs> Diary of the Dead, for instance. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, Romero yeah. alone did six of them. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah. Poor guy. So alien, other than the female protagonist, what would you like about that one? Um, I loved the design again, going back to my obsession with these technical things. Um, obviously Hmm. there had never been a creature that looked like that. And, uh, the, uh, just the, the nature of the ship. I love that they turned space travel into a real like down and dirty, a bunch of truckers in space. Yeah. Uh-huh. Love that about it. Yeah. That's another critique I hear often of it. It's like it, it makes space travel more occupational and less fantastical because just like that, they're, they're space truckers. Yeah. And they're, they're people who, Sorry. who argue with each other, but then get together and have a meal and, you know, you just got a real sense yeah. of, yeah, this is like me at my job kind of thing. Mm hmm. Just in space. Mm-hmm. Anything else? Um, just <laughs> and obviously, you know, the extraordinary Giger design of that thing was yes. incredible. Mm-hmm. If I may, I think maybe you uh, also liked it because it is similar to Near Dark in that uh, the dark shots in it are just beautiful. Right? Done. Yeah, absolutely. Did you start participating in Halloween again as an adult? I did. Um, I was in the mid eighties. Um, I started working for a gentleman named Tom Berman and Tom Berman was one of the great makeup effects artists. Um, he is now retired living in Santa Barbara, but this was a guy who had done everything from the Manitou to close encounters to cat people to, I mean, just, in really, really um, crazy stuff. And, and he and I found a mutual interest in the kinds of stories we were interested in telling. And we started writing together. And so occasionally at Halloween, he would say, hey, do you want us to make you up as something fun for Halloween? And, you know, when one of the world's greatest yeah. makeup artists asks you this, you're not going to say, yeah, no, <laughs> right. no, no, thanks. You say yes. So, yeah, I, yes, I did please. a few, um, let him do a few. He and his wife, Barry, did some really, really cool things on me. One year, my, my favorite one was the year that Twin Peaks was out, and they made me up as dead Laura Palmer. Um, nice. Which was, in a bag? It, in a bag, which I realized. <laughs> okay. <laughs> after I was wrapped in the bag, I realized I was going to suffocate myself in that damn bag. Right. But <laughs> Right. And also, so am I just going to potato sack hop everywhere? Tonight? Yeah. Like- <laughs> yeah. That, that part of it was a mistake, but the face that they did was, of course, stunning. Nice. Any other favorites, Ring a Bell? Um, not really. And uh, this this sounds really awful for someone who is now considered a Halloween expert to say, but I truthfully have never been hugely, um, as an adult at least, into costuming. I am much more interested on Halloween in doing a yard haunt. We do. Uh, we bought a house in 2015 mm-hmm. here in LA, finally, and so ever since we got the house, we've been doing our own little like yard display. That's very soft and family friendly. You know, just a haunted graveyard kind of thing, and we just love doing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's um, that's not uncommon. You know, this company, a couple of guests that we've spoken to, you either do both or uh, like costumes or Halloween at, at Halloween or uh, decorating or uh, specifically in the decoration department haunts on your own. Property. Yeah. It's always a fun thing. It to do. is. Have a maze, scare the shit out of people. Mm-hmm. You know, we, um, we don't yeah, go for anything. Costume person. Yeah. 
we Sorry, you were saying? We don't go for anything too gory or too jump out and scare you kind of thing, but um, we get families who come, and we're kind of tucked away in a cul-de-sac, and we're a little hard to find, but we get the, the families now who come every year and make their kids pose in the graveyard or with the monsters or whatever, and we just we love just seeing that. Nice. Excuse me, other than Tom, do you have any other friends or family who are now horror fans in your, like a social group as an adult? As an adult now, they're pretty much all <laughs> um, horror people now. <laughs> and um, I mean, I just, I love being around horror writers. Um, so most of my best friends at this point are horror writers. Um, I ended up becoming a domestic partner with a horror actor. My significant other is Richard Grove, who played Henry the Red in Army of Darkness. Um, so, yeah, I am surrounded by horror people at this point. Hmm. Yeah, as I was saying that, I was just picturing the uh, uh, the awards ceremony at HWA. There, there were like, what, 400, 600 people in that room? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Have you had any reoccurring dreams as an adult or any scary dreams as an adult? I haven't. And in fact, it's weird that I rarely even remember my dreams at this point. Um, I'm always kind of jealous of the authors who wake up and remember their dreams and get really great stuff out of them. I find you have to write them down. Otherwise you do forget. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I mean, within seconds, I've, yeah. I've had a notepad on the other end of the room before and I go to write it down and it's like, ah, it's gone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been actually terrified of something in real life as an adult? Well, the thing that terrifies me now is developing dementia. Um, mm. I took care of my mom for many, many years. She actually suffered from dementia for about 15 years. And uh, I was her live-in caregiver for part of that time. And, um, I mean, when you are awakened at 3 in the morning with her standing over your bed talking about the people who live in the hallway closet, um, that is both immediately terrifying and also leaves you thinking, oh, you know, please don't let me go down that route. Um, and I would see, she would, uh, and she had always been like the most cheerful, happiest, kindest, optimistic person I ever knew. And, and the 180 degree personality switch in her was extraordinary. And um, I mean, she would be terrified of things quite often that were not there. And, and that is, like I said, something I do not want to endure. Yeah. My aunt had a very strange um, kind of dementia that would only crop up when she was hospitalized. Mm -hmm. We'd not, we'd, had hmm. never heard any of it, anything like it before, and and don't know really what it was. But she, I guess, on some very deep level, had some sort of phobia, maybe related to hospitals. That yeah, like she, the first thing that came to mind for me when some, she some kind was, of trigger. yeah, if she were hospitalized, she would start saying things about you know seeing you know dead children in 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 the hallways and dead they're you know telling telling us about how they're killing children and putting them in the basement and stuff like that and then and then you take her out of the hospital and she'd be fine again well i and she'd be fine for like a year or two and then you she'd go back to the hospital for something and it would kick in again it was just very strange uh things like things like anesthetics absolutely ramped up my mom's dementia hmm i wonder if she's yeah. on any painkillers i don't know I mean, anesthetics are heavily disassociative on their own, so maybe they, they would just, yeah, it'd be like nitrous oxide for a uh, yeah. dementia. I could ask, I guess. Um, was there ever, has there, has there been a time in your adult years when you have felt completely calm or safe or bliss? Um, I think when I'm around my horror family, as I call them, I am always mm -hmm. Very nice. happy to be around everyone. I just returned from StokerCon in Pittsburgh a couple of weeks ago, and um, it was a fantastic trip. And uh, just, it was the most fun I've had in a while, for sure. Understandable. Um, let's see. The next two questions I'm going to ask could be, I'm going to ask them at the same time, because it could be the same answer for both. Or it could be two different answers. Um, first one being, what movie have you seen more times than any other? And then the other being, what would you think, what do you say is your favorite movie? 
Well, it is the same answer to both. It's The Exorcist. Um, I think I think I saw it about a dozen <laughs> times within the first year of its release. It was the kind of thing where I would like sneak out of the house and get into a theater and go see it again. And I just, you know, I became obsessed with breaking it down and studying it and trying to figure out mm-hmm. how it worked. Um, you know, I was like 15. And, and so this was my first kind of, oh, art can do this to people. How did they do this? And I read mm-hmm. everything I could get on it. They were fortunately putting out a ton of books about the making of it. I studied the heck out of all of those things. Um, so... You want to talk about uh, dissecting The Exorcist and, and how they did things. And uh, uh, to your comment about your voice earlier today, I was watching something about just, you know, little known facts, one of those YouTube blurb things on, on horror movies. And The Exorcist was in there. And apparently Nancy Reagan uh, was voiced by a different actress who smoked two packs a day to get that voice yeah mercedes <laughs> mccambridge yes an older older actress that is insane. yeah she she also claimed that she ate like raw eggs or something to get some of the gurgling sounds <laughs> i i oh god i swear i've done none of that today by the way <laughs> that Maybe is tomorrow. method acting to its fine wow <laughs> um just uh, to give us something as comparison, if we were to ask the question then about books, is there a book that you've read more times than any other or a favorite book? Um, hmm, probably this is the one I've already talked about, The Dark Country. Although with me, I tend to read certain short stories over and over rather than like entire books. Um, there are a couple of the Edgison short stories I've read way too many times. Uh, I think probably my favorite short story is one by him called The Dog Park. And again, it's one of those things where you just keep reading it and saying, how did he How did he do this? You know, I mean, it's, it's a story that is so deceptive because on the surface there's not a lot going on and yet it just, it starts building this sense of dread as you're reading it. Um, and I love studying those kind of things and just figuring out how it worked. Hmm. hmm. Do you see, well, I think I already know the answer to this, but I'll ask anyway. Uh, do you see any common threads about what kinds of horror you like? Can- cannibalism, occult, metaphysical, zombie? <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, definitely more emphasis on characters, on psychological development, but I, I love monsters. I'm not one of those people mm. who is dismissive of the supernatural side of horror. I love that element of it because I think it creates such great metaphors and Um, such a wonderful kind of visual sense, even in fiction. Um, Mm. So I'm probably not a huge fan of the more extreme horror, the stuff that is much bloodier and gorier, um, doesn't always interest me as much. But um, even there, I mean, you know, if it's well done, I'm going to like it. Right. So this is normally the point where we would talk about some of the topics that have come up more than once um, and give you an opportunity to say either yes, we're, you know, right on the target or maybe a correct course if you prefer. But so the things that I'm hearing coming up multiple times have to do with the relationships. Um, You know, mentioned, I think it was one of the Sturgeon books, uh, exploring relationships, isolation, both in relation to, you know, what you went through with your teenage years, uh, with being caregiver for your great grandmother, as well as earlier childhood moving around a lot and maybe some isolation based on some of your interests. There's some also, you know, empowerment, which I think also kind of ties in with some of the exploring the relationships. If you were to say that, you know, if there was a common theme to what you enjoy most out of horror do you think that's a an accurate summary or do you think there's something more to it than that or something else that we haven't touched on um excuse me no i think that is pretty accurate i would add to that only that um because we moved around a lot when i was a kid and because there was these these times where i would feel isolated i think that actually served to make me a storyteller because i used to sit you know, and and read these books and then think about the kinds of stories that I wanted to tell or 
um, tell myself little stories to keep myself entertained, especially when we were being dragged off on these hunting trips. Um, and I would be stuck in a, like I said, a freezing cold camper in the middle of Wyoming or Iowa or something. And I remember um, looking through like monster magazines and, and thinking of stories that I would make up to tell with those those photos that I was seeing in those magazines. That's a good point. I, I can relate to that as well. By the time I was 10 years old, we had moved 13 times and I, my father had a company vehicle. So a couple summers in a row, he drove me around the country doing a, a very long road trip across basically from Milwaukee and Chicago down to Fort Lauderdale, up to Philly and back to Chicago and, and Milwaukee all within two weeks to see family all over the country. And we, like I said, we did that a couple of years in a row. And so I had a lot of time to entertain myself and, and also having moved around a lot, you know, like, like I said, I didn't have a lot of friends either in terms of, cause I was always the new kid on the, on the street. So I have at different times in my life felt frustration with other people that I didn't feel have the capacity for imagination to the degree that I feel that I do. Like I, some, I, I like reading things and if other people need to have it put on a screen in front of them, I can understand that. But at the same time, it's like, but you, like you can't read it. Like you can't imagine these things. It, it, it's not so much frustrating always, but just like, it's, it's just hard to relate to that because I guess just cause I didn't have a choice, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think if you're a reader in particular um, and you meet people who are not readers, it can be hard to explain to them what the joy is of reading is compared to watching something on a screen. Yeah. I feel personally attacked. <laughs> <laughs> I've well, read like two books in my lifetime. A whole two. <laughs> Not counting school books. <laughs> Silence. Not count- I was I was coughing. I was choking on my own uh, <coughs> shock at your statement, sir. No, I read uh, Jurassic Park because the movie looked cool, and then I wanted to read the book, and the book was, of course, better. And then Ender's Game in preparation to uh, watch Ender's Game when it came out in theaters, and uh, the book is always better. Yeah. Yep. Well, uh, the next question then, it, I mean, typically we would ask, why are those things important to you? I, I think in your case, it's pretty clear why those things, you know, dealing or, or talking about those kinds of topics are important to you because you experienced them yourself. Um, the follow up question then would be why horror? Because for example, isolation or personal relationships aren't those topics that can be explored in other, excuse me, other genres. Well, I've always loved um, horror's sort of primacy. It's it's so uh, just kind of black and white. It's it's everything. It's kind of like you get rid of all the bullshit and just get to the good stuff, you know. Um, I suspect that the very first stories that were ever told were probably horror. You can imagine people sitting around the campfire after the hunt at night and looking into the shadows and thinking, wow, what if that mammoth we killed today comes back? Um, I just have always been drawn, I think, to that intense emotional state of horror. And um, I mean, certainly I grew up loving science fiction and reading a lot of science fiction, and I don't have a huge interest in writing it. And I think it's because it does tend to focus more on um, science. And um, I would rather get right into that emotional stuff. Hmm. When you talked about the, you know, what if the mammoth comes back? It's kind of interesting because from the reading that I've done and the time I've spent thinking about these things too, that, you know, some of the earliest mythologies had to do with those, exactly those kinds of topics, not necessarily about, you know, like a zombie mammoth, but, you know, we had to, we had to learn or find a way to justify to ourselves this whole business of killing animals to eat them for our own survival, you know, back at a time when animals could just as easily kill us uh, and eat us, you know, there, to sort of be able to make peace with the 
what is essentially murder, um, how do you make peace with that? And part of the ways that people made peace with that back then was to come up with a story about, you know, rebirth and the cycle of life and, mm-hmm. and things like that. Right. Um, which, depending on how you approach it, can be horrific. So I guess really, uh, you know, has there been anything else that you think is relevant that hasn't come up on the call or has, did the conversation maybe take a left turn when you had something else to say and didn't get a chance to say it? Um, no, nothing else is coming to mind right now. Um, I really like a lot of the interesting things we talked about. (laughs) Our pleasure. Yes. I guess we've got a little time on the clock. I'm looking at, uh, Give you an opportunity, you know, is there maybe a question that you've always wanted to answer that you've never been asked? Well, I can tell you, I do a lot of these interviews. Um, I'm often interviewed as either a Halloween expert or a paranormal expert because I have written a number of nonfiction books about the history of ghosts and seances and so forth. And I, I am, um, I, you always get the question, what scares you? And I am mm. far more um, impressed by the way you phrase that. <laughs> <laughs> which is to actually dig into the history of it. You know, that, that sort of what scares you becomes really flippant and really, um, uh, and I don't have an easy answer to that. I think the, the possibility right. <laughs> of coming up with dementia is the only thing that probably really scares me. And people don't want to hear that most of the time. They want to hear spiders or heights or, you know, something mm-hmm. like that. So It's funny. I've mentioned to Chris and to some of our prior guests that I often chuckle when I see online, you know, people will say, I've liked this movie and that movie and this other movie. So, you know, what are some other movies that I would like? And then the responses are all always either hit or miss. And I always think to myself, the question you need to be asking is what, what am I afraid of? And then, Mm -hmm. and then find movies that deal with those topics, you know, but you know, not everybody has the, either the time or the wherewithal to, to know how to dig into these kinds of things or even if they want to. I have uh, to tell you that I've seen a couple of horror movies about dementia and I didn't like them because I felt like they got a lot of it wrong. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. Relic was, was exactly good, right. But <laughs> right. That's the one I was thinking of. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry to, to, to name drop it. I know we were <laughs> yeah. trying to keep it ambiguous and nice, but I knew what you were talking yeah. about. It was it was good, but a, 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 a bit of it was uh, heavy handed. I think you know. Plus, well, that's also the challenge. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Some of the things like uh, dealing with social service organizations and dealing with caregivers and all that. I mean, I've been through all of that twice now, and I know how it works. And I just, I another one was the taking of Deborah Logan. You know, and you just look at it and you go, "Well, they they were close, but that bothers me that they didn't get that part right." Hmm. I was just going to say, that's always the challenge is there's two challenges. One is, do they tell it well? Mm-hmm. The other is for the people Accuracy. who do do their, no, I was going to say for people who do do their homework and realize that this is what fr- that frightens me, then maybe finding movies to touch on those things might hit a little too close to home. Yeah, Cause if maybe. it's too well done, <laughs> that's not so not necessarily a good thing. True. So also you said do do. <laughs> ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we appreciate your time. If there's somebody who you'd like us to speak to, there is a wish list sort of guest list on our website. Go check that out. See if they're on the list. If they're not, let us know. Uh, you can also support us. We've got Patreon, buy us coffee, there's merch. Uh, just tell a friend. 